Welcome, everybody, to the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com. We are coming to you live from the sunny Southern California town of San Diego, where we are attending the 2016 PMI Global Congress. And when I say sunny, I mean sunny because we are sitting outside overlooking the beach. And with me is Dr. David Hilson, the risk doctor. Hello, David. Hello, Good Cornelius. morning. What a lovely place for an interview. It is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Better than some we've done. <laughs> Absolutely. We've done a couple in the hallways. We've done one in the in the exhibitor hall. And now we're outside here in the sun. This is great. It's getting better and better I every year. So. <laughs> David, you are going to be talking about risk as you are on most uh, at most PMI congresses. But before we go into your risk presentation... We have to mention that you are the co-chair of the upcoming PIMBOK 6. That's right. It's been a, a major expedition for me, a commitment of over two and a half years. We started in August 2014. I'm the vice chair to the wonderful Cindy Dionisio, who I know you've also interviewed yes. here. And uh, the good news is that we submitted the final manuscript for um, to PMI Publications on the 15th of September, just a, about 10 days ago two days earlier than our original schedule that we made in August 2014. Wow. Despite a one one month delay when there was a problem with the exposure draft software and a six week delay when PMI decided they wanted to change the focus on agile. So we had two major delays and we still delivered two days early. Wow. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. And you mentioned before we started the interview that there was a shift in risk and stakeholders, which sort of led to your presentation. That's exactly right. We uh, have a wonderful team, the core committee for the Pinbot Guide 6th edition update, and we have a global expert in stakeholder management who came on board to help us sharpen up the focus of Chapter 13, uh, Project Stakeholder Management. Uh, and my responsibility, amongst other things as the vice chair, uh, has of course been the risk management chapter. We really have done some good work with the stakeholder management chapter in bringing it up to date, making it much more practical so we can understand how to use that. And actually, the risk management chapter, risk management continues to develop and evolve, which is why I'm still interested in it. And we've also just brought that a little bit further forward, made some extra steps in risk management. And so you'll find in the sixth edition uh, increased emphasis on both stakeholder management and risk management. And that led to uh, me putting this paper together, which is about managing risky stakeholders, putting right. the two disciplines together. Yeah, it's titled, My Stakeholders Are My Biggest Risk, Help. And the opening statement in the abstract is, stakeholders can pose a real risk to our projects. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, um, I think we all recognize that um, we have a fairly broad stakeholder uh, network involved in our projects. And you know, there's an informal definition of a stakeholder, uh, somebody who can really ruin your day. Um, <laughs> they're those kind of people uh, and organizations and groups uh, who have an influence, who have power to differing degrees, who are concerned about the project in one way or another. And we all know we have to take care of those people. Um, but the idea that they pose a risk, I think, gives us some insights into how we can understand their influence and actually manage them using a risk-based approach. Um, so... Uh, we'll get into this perhaps in a little more detail soon, but I see risk as uncertainty that matters. That's my starting yep. definition of risk, as you know. The behavior of stakeholders is very often uncertain, and it absolutely matters. matters yes. So that means because they are uncertainties that matter, then they're risks. Absolutely. Now, th this may be a completely inappropriate question, but is there a group of stakeholders in your experience that poses the biggest risk to our projects. Can we, can we define them? Yes, uh, it's the sleeping stakeholders, the, ah. the ones with the hidden agendas who are quietly under the surface exerting influence that we don't see in an, in an overt way. So we all know about customers and we all know about the project sponsor and our suppliers and our project team. And there are very visible stakeholders. But then you've got the, the quiet ones. You've got your finance department or your procurement department or the competition uh, or the regulators who are there in the background. And often their influence is quite significant, but it's under the radar. And then they're the ones who pose the biggest risk because we're not managing them proactively. Mm -hmm. 
You begin the paper with the title, People Power in Projects. Can you develop that for us? What do you mean by people power? Well, I want to get to the point of understanding why stakeholders are risky. And they're risky because they have power. But power is a very interesting subject. There are, there's been some really good research on this, which goes way back to the, the 60s or actually late 1950s, um, talking about five sources of power. And each of these we have to recognize are different and different stakeholders come to us with these different sources. So uh, one of them is sanction power. So if somebody has the ability to hurt you or to, with, to withhold something that you value, um, then that gives them power over you uh, because if you don't do what they want, then something unpleasant might happen. Um, the converse of that, the opposite, is those who have reward power. So they can give you something that you value, that you want, if you accept their influence. We have positional power, which is to do with people who have a, a kind of legal authority or authority because of their role, so the boss or the project, stake, uh, project sponsor. The other two are quite interesting. So reward and sanction, positional, but then we have um, those people who are experts, technical experts in a particular area, and because of their expertise, they can demand influence. So they exert power because they know more than you do and so you're dependent on them. And the last is called referent power. It's the sort of uh, the hero worship power, role modeling. Somebody who you admire, who you look up to, who you think, you know, he's a really nice guy and I really appreciate his, uh, his approach and I would like to be influenced by him. And in some ways, that's the strongest source of power of all. And different stakeholders in the network can exert any of those five sources of power and actually any of us can. And one of the things we come back to in the end of the paper is to say when we want to influence stakeholders who are a risk to our projects, we too can exert some of those five sources of power. And, and they're most helpful when we exert them in combination. So if you're a te technical expert who is a really nice guy, you have both expert power and referent power. And if you also have the ability, you know, to, uh, to tell someone what to do because you're the boss, then you have three sources of power and it becomes much more useful to you. So we need to understand those power sources both from the stakeholder side, but also as tools that we can use as project leaders. Mm -hmm. Following the discussion about power, we move into identifying stakeholders mm. and categorizing them. And in the paper, you introduce us to a three-dimensional model of categorizing our stakeholders versus the two-dimensional model that we usually see in the PIMBOK guide. How did you develop that model and why did you develop that model? Well, you will see in the sixth edition of the PIMBOK guide an, an extension or a, a development of the old power and influence grid yes. uh, that we used to have, or influence yeah. and, and interest because I think really it's way too simplistic. There are many ways in which stakeholders can affect our project for good or for bad. And so what we tend to do for simplicity is pick two because then you have a two by two matrix and it's easy to plot. Um, but that also is a bit simplistic. And if you have five different potential ways that stakeholders could affect you, well, which two do you pick? So in the sixth edition of the PIMBOK guide, we're talking about variants on these two-dimensional models. The three-dimensional model uses a cube rather mm -hmm. than a matrix, um, and it allows you to be a little bit more detailed, shall we say, in the way that we think about stakeholders. So our uh, three dimensions are power and interest, as we've had before. So you can be a, a strong stakeholder, have a strong influence or a weak influence. Uh, that's the power. And then the interest, you can be very active and you want to know what's going on and you demand to be involved or very passive and you just monitor from a distance. But there's a third key dimension, which is the attitude of your stakeholder. They could be hostile or they could be uh, helpful and supportive. So we have backers who want the project to succeed and they may have differing degrees of power and interest. Or you could have those who are opposers who um, are blockers of, uh, of our project, uh, who have a negative interest. They actually would rather the project did not succeed and they may have different levels of power and of interest. So we have three dimensions. We have power, strong or weak. We have interest, um, active or passive. And we have attitude, 
backers or blockers. All right. Even though you talked about this being a cube mm. in your paper, it's very difficult to show a three-dimensional cube in a paper, obviously. It is. Uh, you display it as a table. What exactly is the benefit of this three-dimensional approach over the two-dimensional? It's just adding more value, adding more input, more information into the analysis of our stakeholders? Well, I think the three that we've chosen, a power, interest and attitude, actually are the ones which determine how risky a particular stakeholder turns out to be. Mm -hmm. So if their level of power is low, they can't really affect the project, we, they may be less risky. Mm -hmm. um, if their level of interest is weak, so they are not that bothered about the project really, then they pose a lower risk. And if their um, attitude to the project is positive, then again, they may pose an opportunity rather than a threat. So I think we need to take all three into account. If you have a high power, very interested, negative attitude stakeholder, they are a major, major problem. Yes. But on the other hand, if you have a high power positively interested and a positive attitude, a backer to the project, they are also a great benefit to the project. So I think the three together give us a much richer prioritization approach to understanding our, our mm. stakeholders. Depending on the project, would you suggest that, you know, you analyze this table, this, this cube, and you add a fourth dimension even? Because you said you have chosen these three yes. dimensions to be part of the model here. So there must be other dimensions that could be added. So do you personally add those dimensions if you see, okay, in this particular project, we need to go to four, we need to go to five? No, because uh, if you have two dimensions, each with two levels, yeah. positive or negative, you have four options. So you have a two by two matrix right, with four okay. quadrants. If you have a cube with three dimensions <laughs> and each has two options... I see how it will become we difficult have eight, rather we have eight quickly. Options. Yeah. If you have four dimensions, each of which has two possibilities, uh, would, th would that be 16 or would it be 32? 32. Yes, exactly. I, I, my mathematics are failing me right exactly. now. It's 16. But yes. I think that's then way too complicated. Yeah. So we say eight is, is manageable. Okay. So how do I then, once I have identified my stakeholders, how do I influence the risky stakeholders? Well, I think there's a, a prior step um, okay. which we, we mustn't step over, which is to prioritize those stakeholders. Okay. And from a risk perspective, and you won't be surprised to hear me say this, we have to distinguish between threats and opportunities. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, you know, risk is a double-sided concept. We tend to focus only on the bad things. And so it's the stakeholders who can ruin my day that I'm focused on. But of course, there are stakeholders who can give me a great day if I can get them involved in my project. And we really should focus on those too. So some stakeholders are threats and some stakeholders are opportunities. And we can prioritize them. Obviously, the threat-based uh, stakeholders are the ones with a negative attitude. They want the project to fail or they don't want it to succeed. The positive, the opportunity stakeholders are, have a positive attitude. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is we divide them into positive and negative by attitude, threats and opportunities. Then we prioritize them by the other two dimensions into um, power and interest. And uh, interest is, is about um, how big their impact is likely or, or how, um, how likely they are to get involved. So that's a probability dimension. And power is about how big effect they could have. So we end up with a probability impact matrix. Probability is driven by interest. Uh, impact is driven by power. And whether it's threat or opportunity is driven by attitude. attitude. Which right. then means we can produce the classic double PI matrix that we're used to in, in the risk world and prioritize our risks with the red, yellow, green traffic lights that, that we have. Ah, I see. And so that's the kind of missing middle step. Yep. And then we choose our type of response based on where they are on that PI matrix. Mm -hmm. And while we're talking about response, let's go back to Pimbox 6 because mm. my understanding is we now have a new process coming in PIMBOX 6 exactly about implementing risk responses. Is that right? That is right. There are, in fact, two changes in the response part of the risk uh, management chapter of PIMBOX 6. One is that there's an additional process, which is implement risk responses. And that's really important because so many people in their risk process, they identify and analyze the risks and plan the responses and then nothing and happens. And then they file the risk register. A month later, they come back to monitor and control and say, what did we do? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> uh, so we have to have an implementation step. And that's been added in. 
there is actually an additional risk response strategy that we've introduced as well. So we have four strategies for threats in the um, fifth edition. We have four strategies for opportunities. So it's uh, avoid, transfer, mitigate, accept for, for threats. We have exploit, share, enhance, accept for opportunities. We've introduced a fifth one on both sides, and that is to escalate risks that we find that they don't belong to us. That we identify them, we analyze them, we say, this doesn't affect my objectives, it affects somebody else, so I need to escalate it to that person. So on the response side, we have actually, as I said earlier, matured, moved forward the risk management process. But back to stakeholders matrix. Right, back to the stakeholders matrix. So we have these eight uh, types of stakeholders that we have, and then we place them into the two-dimensional matrix yes. where we have threats and opportunities. Now we know which ones are red, which ones are yellow, and which ones are green. And there are eight uh, types of stakeholders, and there are eight types of risk-response strategies. Right. So we have four for threats and four for opportunities. We have four levels of bad stakeholders and four levels of good stakeholders, we can map one risk response strategy to each type of stakeholder. Do you really do it one to one? Do you really say this particular response is specifically for that particular stakeholder group? As a starting point. So if you have high power, uh, high interest, negative attitude uh, stakeholders, right. right? They can really make a big influence. Yep. They're really actively engaged with the project, and they don't like the project. Uh, are those the ones you call saboteurs? Saboteurs. They okay. all have little, yes. little uh, sort of r- reminder names, <laughs> short names. Um, but those are ones we really need to aggressively try and avoid them affecting the project. We need to close them down. We need to isolate them. We need to move them out or change one of their dimensions if mm-hmm. we can. Um, so obviously, high power, high interest, negative attitude, really bad. Yeah. Uh, if we have high power, high interest, positive attitude, really good. These are great, and then we should use the exploit strategy. These are our, our powerful okay. friends, yep. and we should make every um, every effort to release them into our project and, and get them to help us as much as they can. So I think there is a one to one mapping of uh, stakeholder type and risk response strategy. Excellent. All right. Now that we have assessed the managing the stakeholder risk, now we can go to the step that I uh, just jumped to, which is how do I then influence my risky stakeholders? Yes. Influencing without authority has always been one of those phrases that project managers talk about and say we need to be able to do that. In the paper, what we talk about is is two, two ways, two sources of influence. One is those, those power sources that I mentioned earlier on. So to what degree does the project manager have sanction or reward or positional or expert or referent power? Yep. And, you know, there are some ways with each of these different groups of stakeholders that we can exert each of those sources of power. We should certainly be referent. We should be role models of professionalism, of, uh, of, of good character, of reliability, of integrity. So people look up to us clearly. We, we could be experts in certainly in project management or in risk management, but maybe in the solution area of the project. Um, we, we have a level of positional authority depending on where project managers are seen in the project. And then in terms of sanction, well, there's very little we can do to sanction the project sponsor or the, or the boss or the client. <laughs> so maybe that's not relevant. But some yeah, of our stakeholders bite we the can. the hand that feeds you. There are some stakeholders where we could use sanction, maybe our own project team. You know, or some of the other departments like the, the finance department or the, the, the procurement department where we might be able to make their life difficult if they didn't help us. Reward, again, we can reward the team. We can reward our sponsors with information, with, with good data. Mostly it's in that kind of um, uh, expert and referent area. So use the sources of power that are available to you. That's the first thing. The second thing in terms of influence is the use of emotional intelligence. And I think we may have spoken about this in a previous podcast. Um, You know, there's a lot we can do as emotionally intelligent or emotionally literate leaders to influence people really without having the authority to do that. And the model I propose in the paper is one that um, uh, I developed with a colleague, I guess, about six years ago, six or eight years ago, called the six A's model. And so we say the first thing is awareness, what's going on, then appreciation, why is that going on, then assessment, is it okay? If it is okay, we can accept it. So that's our first four A's, awareness, appreciation, assessment, acceptance. 
if we assess that what's going on is not okay, then we need to take action. We assert the need for change and take action to make the change. So the six A's model, which we describe in the paper, is a nice framework for influencing people, being aware of where, where they are, how they're influencing the project and why, and appreciating the reasons, the underlying reasons, and then either intentionally trying to exert influence through assertion and action, or intentionally choosing to go with the current situation. And of course, a monitoring and feedback loop to stay on top of things. Right. So through exercising different sources of power, and exercising emotional intelligence, we can influence our stakeholders. And at this point, I'd like to encourage our listeners to actually pick up the paper from David from the PMI Global Congress website and take a look at the six A's model because um, it really comes alive and it's really much, much simpler when you see it visually yes. in front of you. It, it makes a lot of sense and it is quite helpful uh, to, to influence the stakeholders it, as a v mind map, so to speak, exactly. a map in your mind on how to approach them. It's a thinking process. Yes. That's right. Yes. All right. What are some practical tips and traps in all of this? Let me focus on perhaps th three of each. In terms of good things, tips, obviously we do need to know our stakeholders. I think The military people might say, know your enemy, but that's perhaps a little bit, uh, a little bit biased. <laughs> know, know your stakeholders. If we're going to assess their level of power and influence and interest um, uh, and attitude, then clearly we need to know them. And it's difficult to do that from a, from a distance, remotely. So we need to invest time and effort in understanding our project stakeholders and uh, how they could affect the project. We do need to understand those sources of power. And I think it is worth just reflecting For myself, against each of these main stakeholder groups, where are my levers of, of influence? You know, how can I affect the way that they approach the project? And then developing that emotional literacy. I think those, I would say, are the three practical tips. L make sure you are emotionally intelligent. You know what your sources of power are, and you know who are the people you have to deal with. Um, on the downside, I think, again, three things complacency it's uh, it's very easy to think that your project is okay and it probably isn't i mentioned earlier on about those sort of under the radar stakeholders we all have stakeholders who can affect the project and we need to just recognize them and if we think our project has no um, stakeholders that are affecting us we're actually wrong there always are so um, you know don't get complacent a, a second trap is the, the the kind of generic risk trap of focusing on the negative We always think stakeholders are the ones who can ruin our day. They're the bad influence out there who can hold us back. And some of that is true. But there are also opportunities. There are good stakeholders, and we should embrace those and, and use them to help us achieve uh, what we want on the project. Don't only focus on the negative. And then the third trap is that we do our stakeholder analysis at the beginning of the project, and then we stop. And, of course, stakeholders, like everything else in the project, they change and they develop and they move on and we get new ones and they change their attitude or they get more or less influence as, they, as the project goes on. So we do need to keep our stakeholder analysis up to date and revisit it you know, at key, key uh, phase points in the project. So the, the tips would be know who your stakeholders are, know your sources of power, and develop emotional literacy. And the, the traps then would be beware of complacency, don't focus only on the negative, and don't just do it once. Make sure it's repeated. Okay. Many of our listeners are probably right now going, oh my, yes, stakeholders are important. I have completely forgotten about them because I have been so down in the weeds trying to get the tasks done. Now what? What is your recommendation to our listeners who find themselves right now in this situation saying, oh my, what do I do now? I completely forgot about this. This is really important. David is right. Uh, well, of course I'm right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we had a very interesting keynote at the conference here um, yesterday, which was a group of fighter pilots yes. um, talking about how they deal with uncertainty in the cockpit. And they said how they had uh, 370 dials in front of them and they had you know, radio in their ears and they had things going on outside the screen. And there was way too much for them to think about. So they were all suffering from task overload. Mm -hmm. And then the keynotes talked about how you deal with task overload in a cockpit situation. And they talked about task shedding. 
And they do that in two ways. One is that they have a co-pilot uh, who is responsible for some of the tasks. Yep. So you, you share the work with others, delegation maybe. And the other is you focus out of 370 dials on seven. And they have particular dials. Is the airplane straight and level? How fast are we going? How high are we? These kind of things. Um, and then you use those seven dials to fly the plane and the other dials as and when you need them. And I think they're great tips for us when we're down in the weeds. Uh, let's share the load. Let's involve other people, not try and do it all ourselves, especially the technical tasks. The project manager needs to lead the project, not do all the work of the project. And then secondly, find your key indicators and look at those. And surely stakeholders must be some of those key indicators which could affect the, the health and success of the project. So task shed get other people to do the routine day-to-day -day things focus on what's important and take five six or seven of those things one of them should be risk and one of them should be stakeholders thank you very much what a wonderful conclusion i think uh, we don't have to go any further here david thank you so much for your time once again well it's been a pleasure i should also say this is the last North American Congress I'm coming to. I know. So it may be You're the last of our You're forcing me to come to Europe. Please come to Europe in Rome in May. It's a fabulous venue for the European Congress. And uh, I'm going to be there. Lots of great colleagues will be there. It will be a great place to do PM podcasts. All right. Thank you, David, again. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Cornelius.